Hello. It's been a while since I've played this. Um, let's keep going. I realize I'm covering up the rest button, but it's whatever. We shall rest. See where the night takes us. Oh. You wake up. This is not your haven. It's a cramped space. You try to move your arms and find they are tied to your body. You can barely bend your legs. When you try to stretch your neck, you hit a cold ceiling. <gasps> are we in a coffin? You can't quite believe it, but... This is a coffin, or something close enough to it. I knew it! I'm so clever. It vibrates slightly, but you can't hear any sounds coming from outside. It's entirely dark. Um, well... I'm gonna call out. Hey! Hey! Anyone there? What the hell is this? Oh! Oh, I pressed a button. I'm so sorry. Give me a sec. Um... I pressed a button again. Good lord. Oh, we have all this. Um, let's go from here. Answer oh, potato. I keep doing this. I keep pressing a button by accident. Hey, hey, anyone there? What the hell is this? No answer. Just your voice reverberating in the small metallic space. You're not sure what else you expected. This is bad. Suddenly, the container is moved slightly. A moment of silence. An indistinct male voice shouting. A muffled shot. Silence again. The lid comes off. What the? D'Angelo? Well, I'll be damned. The shifty fucker delivered the goods. Tamika. Tell me I didn't just cut the driver up for nothing. D'Angelo. We gotta scram and fast. Follow us. Seeing their faces is surprising, even more so in these circumstances. However, you realize the immediate danger and follow your companions out of the car and down a street in North Bronx. The van has crashed into another car. A familiar face, that of Kaiser's ghoul Jackie, stumbles out of the wrecked sedan and slinks away into the darkness before you can call after him. The three of you jog away toward the line of the trees and take shelter under some branches, just as you hear a chopper approaching. Its searchlight illuminates the wrecked van and moves towards you. D'Angelo. Lay low. D'Angelo does his disappearing trick and vanishes from sight. You look to Tamika and almost do a double take when you see her submerged up to her neck in the soil. She then disappears entirely underground. You're left alone with just seconds to make your move before the spotlight finds you. Uh, dive under a nearby bush. Seeing no better option, you find the nearest bush and dive right under it. It's probably not the best or smartest thing to do, but you have to trust your gut. The illumination passes only inches away from you, but it's just a pattern of light on the ground. The trees block a good portion of it. It doesn't dwell on you. It doesn't seem like they've spotted you or any of your companions. The helicopter flies on, its searchlight frantically moving through the vicinity as your companions once again appear in your proximity. Nice job, kid. They seem to be moving on. Come on, before these SI fucks change their mind. Uh, care to tell me what's going on? Wait here, both of you. Tamika, fill them in. I'll go scout ahead. The SI nabbed you two days ago. They raided your haven, staked you while you slept, and took off with you. We only learned this last night from Kaiser of all kindred. Uh, what about Sophie? Is she safe? If they hit my haven, then what about Sophie? Is she safe? Couldn't tell you. Kaiser didn't say. Hey, I saw Kaiser pull up. Come on, time to blow this joint. Kaiser's familiar car stops nearby, and the back door opens. Your allies usher you inside and join you. Being inside this mobile fortress never felt like a relief, until now. Hey, fledgling, miss me? Yeah, actually. 
Actually, yeah, I kind of did. Aw, oh, that's so sweet. I hate to break it to you, but I didn't take a sudden liking to you. I'm here on business. On brand. You'd know a thing or two about that, wouldn't you, detective? You are here now only because I told your buddies that you were neck deep in shit. That van you're in? One way ticket to Hartville, Pennsylvania. <laughs> I broke you out as a favor. Now, you are me. Big. Uh, why didn't I wake up earlier? Uh, how did you know? How the hell did you know the SI broke into my haven and took me away? Is that a piss poor attempt at an insult, fledgling? I've kept eyes on you ever since that little job you did for me in Nolita. You know, in case I needed you for something else. I had to know your comings and goings. I have a good idea of why the SI hit you, Celine. Not that there aren't tons of good reasons for it. It might have been one of these, for instance. The screens in Kaiser's car flicker, and each one, each of them now shows a short looped clip. It's you. Getting into a fight, feeding, using one of your powers. Oh my god, I am the worst vampire of all time. Are you serious? I'm so bad. Oh no. You haven't exactly kept a low profile, fledgling. I get it. You're new to this. You didn't know better, yada yada yada. The fact is, the SI has tons of this stuff. Security camera footage, YouTube videos posted by onlookers, social media posts from victims, you name it. Like I said though, I don't think any one of these did you in. Slip-ups happen. Not to you though, right? I always wondered. How is it that you can drive a pompously luxurious limo around NYC and not get caught? What's your secret? Body doubles? Decoy cars? Kaiser smiles, going for that anthrop anthropomorphic piranha look you saw a few times before. You do know what killed the cat, don't you, Mr. Finch? D'Angelo freezes and scratches his face, looking fiercely at the other Nosferatu. You notice that his hands are shaking. Well, do you? Stop shouting up on the upholstery and answer, or should I use your given name too? Whoa. Kaiser seems to know a lot about a lot, huh? Yeah, I know why the cat croaked. You would, wouldn't you? Cryptic? You've never seen D'Angelo serve anyone a death stare quite like the one he's shooting Kaiser now. As much as I enjoy tempering your overinflated ego, we're nearing our destination, so I think I'll move on. The reason I need you walking and talking, Celine, is to test a hypothesis of mine. For that, I need you to finish what you were tasked to do. So first things first, here. He hands you a phone. The number has already been dialed. You hear the tone. Somebody picks up. Who is this? Uh, it remains silent. You don't say anything. Hello? Hey Langley. What do you want? There's somebody here who wants to talk to you. They're just shy. He shoots you a glance that doesn't leave much up to interpretation. Sophie, it's me. Celine, are you okay? What are you doing with that creep? Temper, or I cut the line. And the fledgling throat. Come on, Celine, spit it out. Uh, Kaiser saved me from the SI. Kaiser saved me from the second inquisition, Sophie. I only got out because of him. Your companions look at one another dejectedly. SI? That's what I feared. Listen, the plan. We need to do it tonight, but if the Inquisition is involved and you broke out, they'll be looking for you, so we can't meet in public. I have a place in mind, but... Kaiser, are you still listening? Would I tell you if I wasn't? Celine, call this number from... Where you visited before last we spoke, I'll come pick you up. What does that mean? She hangs up. And that's that. Gotta tell you, kid, this entire conversation has my curiosity, alright? Yes, I feel like I missed the part where you were involved in some conspiracy. Ha! Huh. 
them, us, D'Angelo here, and every other kindred in this goddamn city, and everywhere else as far as I know. We'll talk more after our mutual acquaintance continues with their night. Oh. My entire is worth a damn. Your next stop, Celine, is right about here. The car comes to a stop, and the door opens. Outside, you see the street leading to solids and stripes. Talks pool club. Pool pub, even. Wow, I can't read. Well, you need me to kick you out? Uh, what about my companions? What about D'Angelo and Tamika? What about them? They're staying right where they are, and we're gonna have a little chat. After we're done, I'm sure they'll find their way back to the havens just fine. The clock is ticking. I think I know what Soapy wants to do tonight, and if I'm right, tonight's the last chance you've got. If you want to say bye to your buddies before you go, that's fine by me. But that schedule of yours is pretty hectic, so you better do it now and scram. Thank your companions for the help. You thank both of your companions for their assistance. Without them, you wouldn't be here now. Kaiser makes a gagging gesture and urge, urges you to step out of the car. You turn around and make your way to the bar. The door closes behind you and Kaiser's limo starts moving again. You hope your companions won't have to pay too high of a price for helping you. The Solids and Stripes is pretty much abandoned tonight, with only the bartender and one bleary-eyed local watching an old Bogart movie on the bar screen. You ask to use the phone and call Sophie first. Yes? Are you on your way? I'm here. Are you on your way? Yes, we'll be there in about 15 minutes. Notify Talk if he's not there. We need to talk soon and move quickly. She hangs up. You tell the bartender to notify Talk. Just like the Anarch leader mentioned you should. The man makes a short call. You only hear somebody picking up, but no words exchanged. The owner's on his way right now. Can I get you anything while you're waiting? Do you serve the special stuff? Actually, do you serve the, um, special stuff? The bartender raises an eyebrow. The special reserve, you mean? Sorry, I can only reserve that to a narrow selection of the owner's friends. Um, it's been a rough night, give me a break. Listen, it's been a rough night. Give me a break, please. Just a sip. I don't know, I really shouldn't. Ah, oh, what the hell. You really do look like you need it. He takes out a bottle from a safe behind the counter and pours, pours a bit of brown liquid into a glass. It's whiskey. There, enjoy. Your disappointment is palpable. At least the smell is nice. Oh, get owned. Get owned, Celine. Talk comes in some ten minutes later, without Mia. He tips his hat to you, puts a hand on the bleary-eyed patron's shoulder and says something to him under his breath. They both laugh. Marty, how's the night going? I don't know why, but to Talk makes me think of Snoop Dogg. I think it's the cheekbones and the, the goatee. Quiet, sir. Just how you like it, huh? Talk notices the untouched glass with a bit of whiskey in it that you persuaded the bartender to pour. For me, you shouldn't have. He takes the glass and drinks the liquid, moving it around in his mouth before swallowing. He looks you in the eye. Sure, I won't keep it in forever, but the night when I don't enjoy the taste of good whiskey is the night when I will truly consider myself damned. Well, Celine, I believe you wanted me here for a reason. Let's hear it. You're about to tell him what brought you here when the doors to the bar open and Sophie walks in, all splendor and charisma. The patron's eyes are now glued to her, and so are the bartenders. Hulk isn't happy with the sight. Well, this isn't what we agreed on, Celine. Care to explain? Uh... Things got complicated. We had to improvise. 
Pleasure to make your acquaintance. I believe Celine already told you why I'm here. Not in any detail, and the circumstances of our meeting was supposed to be different. So, Ms. Langley, tell me why I shouldn't ask you to leave and kick out your protege while I'm at it. You will like what I have to say. Yeah, I've heard that line a hundred times, but 99 of those ended with somebody getting hurt. And that's not something I'm in the mood for tonight. We are wasting time. There is a unique opportunity we should take advantage of, and we only have an hour or so to discuss it before it will be time to act. My driver is waiting outside. Wait a goddamn minute. First of all, I'm not going anywhere without Mia. That was the deal. Second, it was Celine who was supposed to do the driving, not your servant. Both serve me, so really, it's of little difference. The circumstances changed and we had to adapt. Don't be stubborn. Foolishness does not suit you. I have a secure spot in mind where we can talk. I'll stop you right there. Hawk is seething, but he's keeping a lid on his anger. His voice barely changes. My conditions were clear. The way I hear it, you want to break each one of them. I see no reason at all to agree to any of this. I believe I will be staying put tonight. You have places to be, yes? Talk, you're throwing away the only chance you have at challenging Callahan. Don't be a fool. The lid comes off. Call me a fool one more time, woman, and that's not the only thing I'm going to be throwing. Uh, Sophie talks right. Yeah, let's side with talks. Go, Sophie. Sophie talks right. This does sound like a setup. I wouldn't trust you either in this situation. You dare? She slaps you fast, hard. <laughs> we got slapped by Sophie. Oh. <laughs> The sound reverberates in the mostly empty bar. I can't believe she slapped. How can she slap? What the heck? Come on, Sophie. Talk smiles. See, Celine? That's the cam in a nutshell. You obey them to the latter or they put you in your place. It's Sophie who's seething now. I don't have any more time for this charade. Fine. Stay here, both of you, if that's what you want to do. What was I thinking, risking my reputation for you, Celine? Shots break the front windows and a flashbang goes off in the room, changing the bar into a space of white light and ringing noise. You feel somebody tugging at your back and are thrown behind the bar. More shots ring out, bottles break. The TV shatters into pieces, the wooden bar splinters. Your sight comes back, but you think you've gone deaf because suddenly the room is silent. You see Talk beside you, and Marty, the bartender, bleeding out on the floor. You look over the bar. Sophie is standing there, her dress partially tattered, a visible hole in her leg. She's like the heart of a supernova, entrancing, unavoidable, beautiful and terrifying. In front of her are eight operatives, looking like a private military force, just standing there. Paralyzed by Sophie's magnificence. Talk, you still there? Yeah. Would you kindly show your guests some hospitality? Sure thing. The Anarch is gone in the blink of an eye and he reappears next to one of the soldiers. The armor clad operative's head disappears in a puff of blood and bone. Ooh. The same thing happens to the second, the third. You hear the radios go off on the other soldiers' shoulders. A panicked voice pleading to them to wake up. The fourth head pops. The fifth. They finally realize what's happening, but it's too late. The sixth man is beheaded by what you now see is just Talk's bare-fisted punch. Oh wow. I want to be that strong, but I think I've messed up my vampire life, so... It's whatever. Talk stops by the seventh man, rips something off his neck and bites down. Sophie walks over to the last man and has him kneel in front of her before biting as well. Wait, I didn't get any? Jeez. On your right, a man in full body armor emerges from the back door, raising his assault rifle. Oh, here we go. What the fuck? Uh, 
Shield. Let's try Fortitude. Shield, so talk and Sophie. It's not smart, but it's what your instincts tell you to do. You jump in front of the soldier just as he pulls the trigger. Bullets sink into your body, ripping and tearing your flesh, each projectile a microbomb exploding inside you. A combat knife crashes through the sol soldier's visor and into his skull. You turn around. Talk is grinning. He mouths something under his breath. Langley? Sophie wipes her mouth with blood and looks at him. That meeting still an item? Yes. I'll take it. Splendid. Talk walks behind the bar and checks on the bartender. You see the Anarch open his own wrist and feed the blood to the wounded man. Drink up, Marty. It'll make you feel better. Get the hell out of here and wait for Mia. She's coming and she'll know what to do. Talk? Yeah, coming. Take the back door. Celine, come on. You slink back into an alley behind the bar, leaving ten bodies and one grievously wounded ghoul behind. Nobody stops you from cycling around the block and finding your way to Sophie's car. Gregory drives away casually, as if this was just another late night drive, and not the crowning of a desperate, complicated evening. What is going on? Have I really been this bad as a vampire? I'm so shocked at myself. Sophie brings you all to a luxurious apartment in Manhattan's Upper West Side. The way she explains it, the vampire who owned it left the city a few years ago and gave away spare keys to a few trusted compatriots. It's been used sporadically since. Fancy. You like it? It always felt too modern for my taste. But what's important is that it's secure. As long as nobody followed your car here, all that fledgling. Troubles follow trouble follows this one wherever they go. Alright, I'm just new. Even if that's the case, we have very little time to conduct our business here anyway, and we'll be leaving soon, I hope. So let's begin. Uh stay silent. You look at Sophie, excited. Finally, you will learn what it is that you've been working towards for more than a week, and what it is that Kaiser wanted you to participate in. I have it on good authority that Boss Callahan is bloodbound to Prince Panhard. Talk sucks air in loudly. Hang on a second, what? That's an accusation and a half there, Langley. Got proof? No, but we're just a boat ride away from getting it. Ah. What is that supposed to mean? Celine, the address that I procured from Kaiser was the meeting spot for Panhards and the Baron's regular sharing of blood. And other bodily fluids, if the rumors are true. Oh. Wait, Kaiser knew about this? Is there anything that insufferable clump of dead skin doesn't know in this city? He knows things, but only shares them if you pay. Neither the prince nor Callahan can touch him. He's too useful. Um... Kaiser said saving me was in his interest. Kaiser said something about having plans for me, that he wanted me to make this meeting happen. That can't be good, right? That is an interesting point. I think Kaiser might be as interested in shaking up the status quo as we are. A chaotic landscape makes for a great market for him, unlike a static one. I don't like playing into that creep's hands, but at least I, now I know that I'm doing it. The devil, you know, and all that. What was the address he gave you? They meet regularly on Ellis Island. In fact, their next scheduled meeting starts in just around half an hour. Hot damn, I'm guessing you want to crash that meeting. Why? So you can see the proof for yourself, so that I can make sure too. And so that I have an extra pair of eyes for Panhard to consider when I present her. Present to her my ultimatum. Oh. The prince must abandon her seat and leave New York City. She can go wherever she pleases, but if she stays, the entire court will know, and the next prince might not look favorably on her past. 
Dealing with Anox, especially so closely, is a punishable offense in the Camarilla, as I'm sure you've heard. So I did. Talk strokes his beard and looks intently at Sophie. What exactly are you trying to accomplish here? Say you remove Panhard, and I even remove Callahan. Then what? Talk, did you ever wonder why Callahan is keeping you in check? Because I wondered why the prince condemns Anox during her visits to Elysium, but doesn't allow the Ivory Ch Tower to challenge you. She or they have engineered the status quo, not for the good of their sects, sects, but for private gain. They keep us all in line because it lets them hold on to power that much longer. And your goal is what? Make this cold war turn hot? Not a great plan. You camis will get your butts kicked out of NYC in no time. If you Anox manage to organize, which I doubt you will, at any rate, it's a risk I'm willing to take. I don't stand alone in this. This entire operation has been years in the making. Oh. Doc, I am offering you a chance to square things with Callahan and level the playing field. If we get rid of these two, we can start on equal footing at the next stage of this Danse Macabre. Macabre. I can't do the R sounds that French people do, so I sound silly. Um, Why am I here listening to all this? Sophie, why am I here? I understand you need me to set this meeting up, but why am I listening to all of this? It's a precaution. In a way, it's a shame this me you told me about did not make it in time to listen to this too. I can still call her, but it'll probably be an hour before she gets here. We can't wait that long. You'll have to suffice, Celine. I am risking the prince's or even Callahan's wrath. While I don't think they would dare to lay a finger on me, another set of eyes to watch over the meeting can't hurt. And I did promise I would explain everything in time, didn't I? You know, after all those years spent in Callahan's shadow and taking part in all the kindred dick measuring contests, I should expect a ruse, some ploy to kill me in an out of the way place. That's our inherent paranoia talking. My gut tells me it's time to get this show started. I do hope you have a boat nearby, Langley. Sophie smiles mischievously. Of course I do. It's waiting for us by the pier. Lead the way then. Moonlight's burning. Oh, I like that phrase, moonlight's burning. I want to incorporate that somewhere. Maybe that'll be the title of the video. The three of you leave the apartment and walk toward the pier. Nobody seems to be following you. You get on a small patrol boat and double time it through the Hudson's cold, dark waters. Out of all the places in NYC where the Prince and the Baron could meet, and it's Ellis Island. A landmark with a dark past. A, muse a museum on one hand, a dilapidated piece of history on the other. You leave the boat and make your way to the southern part of the island, paying no heed to the renovated tourist attractions on the northern side. You expected some resistance, a night guard, a helicopter flying overhead, or maybe an NYPD patrol boat. Nothing. The island seems completely deserted. It's clear this sets Sophie on edge. She's moving as quietly and subtly as ever, but you can see that she's eager to reach the particular house her intel pointed out. Um, is this a trap, you think? I think this could be a trap, but I'm not sure yet. Talk is following suit, grimly determined, flashing his piercing gaze all over. Still clearly uncertain that this isn't some kind of con. Finally, you see it. Light coming from a window in one of the buildings at the edge of the island. The three of you slowly creep closer to the building and take a look inside the window. There it is. Callahan kneeling in front of the pin prince, sucking on Panhard's wrist. Both fully clothed. A small blessing. Talk makes his move, and before Sophie can stop him, he busts through the building's doors. It all happens very quickly. Talk grabs Callahan by the shoulders and throws him through the still open door. Callahan hits the ground, hard. Talk appears on top of him and starts punching. You fucker, you piece of shit. 
Stop. Prince's voice takes hold for just long enough to make talk relent, which the Baron uses to the fullest. He shoves talk off himself and tries to bite down. Oh. Prince, call off your lapdog. Langley, what is the meaning of this? The two Anarchs break apart, both wounded, but neither is quite done yet. They look at one another with pure hatred. Kill the bitch, Helene. Wait, I want to say, I want to call her Helen. Kill the bitch, Helen. Helene. No, let's call her Helene. Kill the bitch, Helene, but leave the fledgling to me. Right after I deal with this shit stain, I'm gonna. A shrill, unpleasant laugh fills the air. You know who it belongs to. So, so entertaining. Truly, it feels almost a shame to break up this spectacle, but alas. Thomas? Who the fuck is this jerker? Ah, yes. I don't think we met. Though, I did hear a lot about you, Mr. Talk. My name is Thomas Arturo, and I... Callahan uses this moment of uncertainty to strike. He's still too slow for talk, who throws the boss onto the lawn, where the two exchange blows once again. Ahem, <clears throat> Helene, if you'd be so kind as to ask your friend not to, to not hurt our guest too much? Callahan, don't kill him. This time, Callahan comes out on top and grabs, grabs talk in an iron hold. Your companion struggles, but qu can't quite break away. I will not be denied, Helene, not this time. You will do as I command. And she will do as I command her, Douglas, old boy. What? Like I was saying before I was so rudely interrupted, I feel like I needed to break up this little spectacle. It's been going on for much too long. Wait, so is the prince a pawn of this guy then? You think you're so smart, Langley? You and your clique figured out that there was something fishing going on all on your own. But you were, but you were always working with just a piece of the puzzle. Oh. Wasn't she, Celine? Sophie looks to you, shocked and disappointed. Um, this is not happening. This is not happening. Oh, I assure you, this is no fever dream. Though it might seem to you like a nightmare. To think that this was all put in motion by me chatting with your sire. Surreal, isn't it? <gasps> he's the one? <gasps> it's him? What? I, he's, I, I didn't know who to expect, but this guy... Um, I need to go back to watch the first video because I don't know if we ever saw his face. You hear a scream and a curse. It's Callahan, whose arm has been, been nearly ripped off his body. Talk breaks out of the Baron's grasp, but doesn't continue the attack. Instead, he's at the edge of the water in the blink of an eye and disappears into the Hudson. The only trace left of him is his, is his fedora. He left his fedora behind? Damn. Another actor going off script at the very end, eh? No matter. Let him bring us some amusement now that the production is almost wrapped up. He'll reach his allies. He'll tell everyone of this. Helene, even if we naively assume his nights aren't numbered now that he's in the SI sites, the show must go on one way or another. Won't hurt to encourage leaks and speculation. Sophie looks at you. How could you, Celine? I saved you. I don't even know what's happening. Arturo suddenly appears next to her and slaps her in the face. Langley, Langley, Langley. What happened to your self-esteem? You can't really think a simple neonate has outplayed you. Or maybe this oblivious act is your way of groveling for mercy? Thomas, what? You thought that being an expert chess player would always be enough. You never realize that the people at the top simply flip the chessboard over and punch you in the face whenever they don't like how the game is going. He motions to the remaining kindred. But the thing is, you weren't even adept at playing the game you knew. Celine, just another pawn placed on the board by my associate. You thought they were your piece since you took them in, 
that. Who gave you that idea? You return to the night where you were judged by Prince Panhard. The woman in red, Sophie. Somebody speaking to her. A man in glasses. The man standing before you now. This is cruel. We know what's going to happen. If only somebody would speak up for the poor child. It could be a useful tool for the Camarilla. Terror creeps onto Sophie's face. Of course, those are not the words you heard, were they? No, you were already grasping for some opportunity to further your scheme. I put the bait out and you took it. Hook, line and sinker. Oh my gosh, I feel so used. After that, it was only a matter of time before you started using Celine as your errand girl. No one is quite as easy to track and monitor as a naive fledgling who's just learning the ropes. What is, what is it that you want, Thomas? What do I want? Oh boy. The answer is so simple, but so hard to put into words. Unstable stability. Cutting edge tales of thrills and intrigue that push it to the limit. And then return you to the tried and tested status quo. Gently, infallibly. A system full of distractingly moving parts, which sim simulate conflict so convincingly that its users never feel a need to direct their energy towards upsetting the system. Achieving the eternal through the disposable. Building a city that's like a ship of Theseus, constantly changing its parts, yet always maintaining the same purpose, serving the same goal at all times. A large-scale in infrastructure that has something. Something like an exhaust system for the spirit. Something that uh, disperses the toxicity around instead of concentrating it in a single place. None of what you're saying makes the slightest bit of sense. Arturo is momentarily stopped in his tracks. He stares into the sky for a few seconds before a sad grin appears on his face. Spoken like someone who's never really had what it takes to make it in the big leagues. With a theatrical snap of his fingers, he gives his last sentence a sense of finality. Something's changed in the air. You could swear you saw a shadow move behind Sophie. Oh. Goodbye, Sophie. A person appears behind Sophie. You can't believe your eyes. Miss Adelaide Davis, holding garden shears in her hands. Uh, apologize to Sophie. Sophie, I'm sorry. Um, you hear the shears snip. Sophie's red hair conceals her face as her head falls, separated from her shoulders. Silence. Arturo's unpleasant laughter erupts right next to you. Oh, Celine, your career is moving at a breakneck pace, moving up and up and up. Let me congratulate you on your promotion. Oh, <laughs> I feel so bad. I feel so bad. Are you going to kill me too? Are you going to kill me too? That was the plan at some point, but I've had a change of heart since then. Elaine, feel free to leave us and take the Baron with you. Thomas, I don't think you should. Shush, you're just being jealous. Adelaide, escort the Prince and dear old Douglas, please. Sure thing, darling. You are left alone next to Sophie's body. You try not to look, but it's hard to ignore her lithe frame decomposing in front of your eyes. Ah... <laughs> uh. Congratulations, you've won this little game. You set out on a suicide mission and successfully brought down the power-hungry wannabe tyrant. Even if it probably wasn't the way you imagined it. Now you're free to enjoy paradise again. Life after death, immortali immortality, eternal youth. What they don't tell you is, of course, living in paradise is inherently sin sinful when not everyone can partake. But you have time to learn how to live with sin, don't you? He takes a melancholic look at the city skyline surrounding him. The Statue of Liberty and the lights of Manhattan shimmering in the distance. You know, New York taught me to believe in fate. 
My own life began right here, and it began with utter despair. My first instinct was to drown myself in books, and keep reading and reading until literature gave me the piece of wisdom I needed to go on. Personally, I find reading a silly hobby in retrospect. I always had this minuscule hope that the next sentence I'd read could finally bring me salvation, but it never did. It only gave me fuel for this elevated, righteous, intellectual suffering. But the more I read, the easier it was for me to boil every paragraph down to a power relationship. The characters influence over each other, the writer trying to impress the reader, etc. The strings everyone pulls started to look like strands that weave into the fabric of fate. And once I saw its beauty, I got teary-eyed. My architect instincts kicked into overdrive. I didn't have to submit to fate. All I had to do was cooperate with it and wait for my time to shine. Give it my input wherever needed until it trusted me to do more. Thomas steps over what's left of Sophie, wiping his glasses with an elegant cloth from his pocket. And it did. Fate let me look after this city. With my architect's tools, I started quietly shaping the streets and corridors while Kaiser and his ilk shaped the information flows. And among many tools this process gave me, one of them was a way to reliably come up with useful agents like you. The methods I used were crude at times, but the route was there. All you had to do was follow it. Some people write rulebook passages, the others plan city arteries. In the end, the effect is the same. Someone always follows. He puts on the glasses and gives you a long, hard look. You know, I have grown fond of you. You did so well. Even when that idiot Callahan tipped the Inquisition off, you still got out. I like that kind of resourcefulness. I could use that kind of resourcefulness. He uncovers his wrist. So, take my blood. Just enough so we can start off on the right foot as a sign of good faith. A sign that you're ready to play into the big leagues. Ready to behold the sights I've prepared for you. Oh, I don't want to do that. What do you say, Celine? Oh. Well, we did it! Um... I thought I'd get a choice there and take the final death or something, but... I don't know how to feel about this one, this game. Cause it felt like it was just building to nowhere and then... And then shit hit the fan real quick, you know what I mean? So I'm not sure. I, I, I'm, and I've seen that... I didn't develop relationships like I should have as much. So I'm probably gonna have to look up a guide and... Figure out where the heck to get all my... All my, all my peeps with me at the end. Um... Pretty alright game, I think, for a visual novel. Uh, I don't really play them that much, so... I'm, I'm sort of debating what to play next. I think maybe Nosferatu playthrough, but I won't record that, I don't think. And then there's also the next one, Shadows of New York, but I'll probably wait a few months for that. Because I don't want it to just be... visual novel overload. What did you guys think? Uh, let me know. Also, if you guys did different tra different choices. So, who were your final people at the showdown, I guess? Um, trying to think what else. Yeah, I had Tamika and D'Angelo. I think you can probably get all, like, Hope, D'Angelo, Agatha, and Tamika. I, I would hope you could get Benoit as well. But I didn't realise my days were quite numbered. I thought I had so much more time. I thought I had so much time to, you know, do it more, I guess. But yeah, I enjoyed that. <laughs>